Uh, if you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Romans, uh, chap- chapter 8, verse 14 to 17. From uh, chapter 8, verse, uh, from verse 14 to 17. Uh, I'll read it for you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. Sorry. Uh, If you remember about two months ago, uh, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake hit Turkey and Syria. And I heard that more than 160,000 buildings got damaged and collapsed. As the ground shook, buildings uh, fell apart quickly and turned into rubble. And if you've seen one of those videos that captured the moment, it's, it's scary. Uh, I have experienced a couple of earthquakes in my life, but it was nothing like those. And how did it happen? So there are two uh, major fault lines surrounding Turkey. And as a tectonic plate underneath Turkey and another one in Syria collided each other, it created a massive, massive earthquake. And it, tr- it was truly a disaster. I think this, reflect, this can reflect our walk of faith. There are times when our foundation of faith is shaken and our assurance and confidence collapse. And when we, we often look at ourselves and question, I want to walk my Christian journey faithfully, but how come I always come back to the same problems and end up in failures? The fact that the sin is still reigning over my life uh, make me, makes me feel that I'm not qualified or contributing to God's kingdom or his church. Because of my mistake and my failure, would God still think that I'm worthy? When these seismic doubts and fear come, we find ourselves in a place without hope. However, today's passage, passage in Romans 8 uh, provide us with a remedy to this doubt and fear. So that we'll, today we'll look at how the Holy Spirit in three ways helps us not only to restore our assurance and confidence of our identity, but also to fix our hope in Christ. So t- the three key points are, first, the Spirit adopts us. Second, the Spirit attests to our identity. Third, the Spirit awards us. So first, the Spirit adopts us. If you look at verse 14, uh, Verse 14 tells us that there's a clear marker that reveals the fact that we are a child of God. It says, being led by the Spirit. But what does that mean? It's not uncommon to hear among believers uh, saying, oh, the Spirit led me to go to this college. I want to to take that job, but God led me to this job. In today's church lingo, uh, being led by the Spirit means Uh, receiving specific and experiential guidance out of many possible options. Certainly, God uh, guides us by opening and closing doors uh, out of many options, but we ought to be careful since uh, it's easy for us to uh, blame God, shift the blame and blame God, uh, abusing this phrase. Remember when Adam uh, blame God after he disobeyed. It is because of the woman that you gave. So rather, uh, since God is leading our lives according to his perfect plan, and just as 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, our sanctification is will, I think it's right to think that, uh, that he is leading us to the path of holiness, which means being obedient to his word to his law and his commandment. Uh, so when in verse 14, when he says, all who are led by the Spirit of God, it means that God is more interested in leading us to the path to holiness, following his word, 
rather than whether I should go to this college or that college, or whether I should root for Manchester City, Liverpool, or Tottenham, because he already knows that Tottenham is the best team. But seriously, if we are led by the Spirit, we want to say yes and amen to Jesus' command. If you love me, keep my commandment. However, this creates some unease in us. If the litmus test that reveals my identity as a child of God is being led by the Spirit, being obedient to His Word or His law, I'm in trouble. Because there are far more times I chase after my physically and fleshly desire more than uh, being obedient to God. Uh, There are so many times I said sorry to God and yet committed the same sin over and over before God. What about you, friends? Do you struggle in the same way? Just like the weeds that keep growing in our backyard, uh, even though we, even after we pluck them out, our sinful thoughts and sinful desire, action, keep growing and growing. The most miserable part is that the fact that we are doing our best to fix ourselves, but yet we re- we repeatedly fail. Then we start to ask questions: What is wrong with me? How come my life has been changed? Why am I still stuck in the same sin? Would God still think that I, am, that I am worthy to be used for his kingdom and his glory, or even called his own? Would he abort his plan and mission when he sees my lacking, my mistakes, and sins? Then doubt starts to grow like a snowball rolling down a hill and morphs into fear. Because Paul's argument in Romans 8 is simple and clear if you look at verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you follow the flesh in disobedience and you you are not following the Spirit into holiness, the only consequence you will end up with is death. And this is scary. And verse 15 amps up our fear even more for he says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Back here in the original language means returning to a previous state or position. Perhaps the fact that I constantly turn towards sin, doubt, and fear may be telling me that I received the spirit of slavery from the beginning. And this fear can shake our foundation, our faith. Sure, there are countless factors that make us uh, fearful, but the fear that comes from the most innermost fundamental and spiritual level, fear that reveals our true color, our true self, fear to know that we are sinners who turn away from God constantly. I mean, what do we do? What can we do? However, the scripture tells us something remarkably different from how we think of our status and our standing. So one commentator said that the antithesis between the two different spirits is Paul's way of highlighting the spirit, the nature of spirit that we truly received. Not the spirit of fear, but the spirit who makes us God's sons. The genuine criterion for being being accepted as a part of God's family is his adoption. Not whether you can keep his commandments until the end, Although they're important, but the key is adoption. So when we think about adoption, we typically think about American couples adopting cute babies from different continents, right? But uh, in, nevertheless, in the ancient Greco-Roman culture, adoption was practiced when a young couple didn't have a child, so they adopted trust, trustworthy and honorable young men. It's intended to pass on family inheritance, such as wealth, land, and name, to those who can honor their family. However, this is not how God, how God adopts us. He adopts untrustworthy, disobedient, and dishonorable sinners who deserve death. He adopts you and me. He voluntarily chose to love and bring us into his family as the ones who will honor his name. And this is where our worth and value come from. 
Remember, the adopted children don't pick and choose their, chil- their parents. Adopting parents pick and choose their children. I mean, how can this be? How could he just disregard our sins, which deserve condemnation, judgment, and death? How is it possible? Is it, it, it is through God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Although the word Jesus or Christ is absent in this particular section we, we read, the very center of Paul's, Paul's argument is Christ. If you see from the earlier verses, 1 to 3, Paul says that you cannot be free from the law of sin and death by keeping the law. Not only you can keep the law, the law itself cannot save you either. Then how can we break free from this law of sin and death? It is through Jesus Christ who came to keep and fulfill the law that we cannot keep in perfect obedience as well as pay the penalty of our sin on the cross on our behalf. So salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and we receive him and accept him by grace through faith, not by our works. So we know that. We know the basic gospel. We tend to have a a firm and strong understanding that we enter the kingdom of God through the saving work of Jesus Christ. But it is easy to think that we lose our standing or degree of our standing or benefits if we continue to sin. So we attempt to stay and maintain our status through self-discipline, religious practices, and standard that we set ourselves uh, for ourselves. However, Paul reminds us that not only we break free from the, sin, law, the law of sin and death, but also we continue to be, have a re- rightful relationship with God, Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says that those who are in Christ Jesus have no condemnation, verse 1. God does not look at your failures uh, in keeping the law when he sees you. He sees the perfectly holy and righteous son, Jesus Christ, who, who is united with you. So in Christ alone, we can have a secure assurance and unshakable fo- uh, confidence that we are transformed from slaves of sin to sons and daughters who can call Abba Father. So when we hear the word Abba, uh, it sounds like a baby's cute gibberish calling for his or her dad. So often, it's thought to be equivalent to daddy. However, in ancient Jewish society, it wasn't used that lightly. Uh, it wasn't used by an, individual, by an individual as a personal or friendly address to God. It was always used for a corporate and community call uh, before the heavenly king. Thus, Father, as a personal and intimate address to God, was firmly rooted in the Christian tradition. In Mark 14, 34, Jesus in Gethsemane withdrew himself in order to be alone with God. In prayer, he called the Father, Abba. It shows the intimacy and his obedient heart before God. And Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit ena- enables us to have this, uh, this kind of intimate relationship that Jesus had with his Father. When we realize that the creator, of our, the creator of the universe is our Father, we no longer have to fall back to fear and doubt. Through Jesus Christ, we can run towards our Heavenly Father who takes care of his children. So friends, let's find Security and safety in Jesus Christ, the surety of our salvation. We may still be weak, doubtful, fearful at times. However, if you're tempted to find assurance of your identity as child of God through your diligence and efforts, then it's not going to work. But remember that you're adopted and saved by the work of Jesus Christ through his spirit. Now, moving on to second point, the Spirit attests to our identity as a child of God. And it is quite comforting to see in verse 16 how the Spirit attests to our sonship once again. God knows how forgetful we are, so he repeats it immediately after. But how exactly does the Holy Spirit testify or bear witness to us? Does the Holy Spirit whisper into our ears and give us a secret and private revelation? 
Surprisingly enough, there are lots of Christians out there wanting to physically listen to the living voice of God. Friends, if a, if a parent only speak to a child when he or she is really, really, really desperate, I mean, what kind of parent is that? Remember, God gave his word as a means of grace to communicate with his children. If we want to communicate with God, we must deep dive into spirit-inspired word. And this everlasting and unchanging word of God confirms again and again that those who are in, uh, in Christ are his children and our sonship is permanent. For instance, Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Our mind can constantly throw questions like, I mean, how can this be when my emotions and feelings seem to say otherwise? But our fear and doubt can quickly submerge once we stand upon the objective, authoritative, the truth, the word of God. Also, there's a power in reaffirming the truth that we possess. About a couple months ago, uh, I had to buy a new car for my sister uh, for the the old one was having too many mechanical problems. So I found the model that we need and started calling dealerships. As you guys know, uh, buying a new car is not easy. Uh, You have to get the multiple quotes from different, different dealerships, and you have to find the exact model that you want on the lot. And then at the dealership, you have to negotiate with the dealers, and you have to make sure there are no hidden fees and no hidden markups. And it can take days and weeks to find the, just the right one. And for a cheapskate like me, uh, it didn't, I, I really didn't want to uh, lose a single penny, so I had to work really hard to find the best car. So it was taking longer than I expected. My mom, who lives in South Korea, called me the other day and asking for how was the process. I told her, oh, because of, you know, this dealership these days are charging extra markups. You know, it's hard for me to find the right card with no or minimum uh, accessory package attached to it. Then my mom was telling me that if there's a model that we're looking for, just buy that one even if we pay extra money. But this was unacceptable to me. We're on a tight budget and I really don't want to spend extra money on something ridiculous. Because on time, one time this dealership was charging $75 for just USB cables. And I'm like, this isn't no crazy rich Asian too. You know, this is not happening. And not today, Satan, not today. And I walked right out. <laughs> and my mom is like, just get the right one. Uh, just get what is available on the lot. And I'm like, no, let me find a better deal. And we were having this ping pong uh, conversation, and I became a bit frustrated, and I started to raise my voice and vent out my frustration at her. Although my mom was calm and collected, I was ranting and whining like a five-year-old in the toy section at Walmart. We ended the phone call not too long after, and all of a sudden, immense amount of guilt, shame dawned on me. I was thinking to myself, you're a piece of work, Daniel. You know, it's your mom who brought you into this world, you know, raised you, fed you, and she continues to you know, sacrifice for you, but you're whining and complaining because shopping is too hard? Get a life, bro. So I called her back right away and apologized for my immature behavior. But then her response was remarkable. She says, it's okay. You know, I'm your mom and you're my son. You can vent your emotions to me. I mean, to whom else would you let your frustration out? Her forgiveness and affirmation of my sonship pierced right through my heart. I could not hold my tears, and I did cry like that five-year-old at Walmart. Friends, if we get so much comfort and confidence, even when our earthly parents embrace us, then how much more will we be free from fear and filled with thanksgiving? and assurance when our Heavenly Fathers attest to our identity as His children again and again through His Word by His Spirit. He knew the sins and failures that we would make before, both before and after we came to Christ. Those will make Him sad, but they cannot quench His love. 
Therefore, when you are in doubt, listen to how the Spirit attests your, ide- your identity, confirm His love, and get comforted through His Word. So moving on to the last point, the Spirit awards us. So far, in verse, from verse 14 to 16, Paul has been uh, explaining how we became adopted through the operation of Holy Spirit, and we are arriving at the climax in verse 17. We get to realize that spirit adoption we receive awards us with great hope. The spirit affirms that we are not only his children, but also his heir, co-heir with Christ. Although we may be adopted, we are still his children. And as you guys know, adopted children legally receive equal benefits and equal inheritance, just like the natural and biological children as a rightful heir. Therefore, we will receive full inheritance and blessings of God's kingdom. We will be raised to a new life with a resurrected body in new heavens and new earth. And it's easy to just focus on the ownership aspect, but we must not forget the relationship aspect as well. We will experience a deeper and more intimate relationship with God with no more fear when, with no more, no more sin. But we must be aware of the fact that if we belong to Christ, we follow his own road to glory, namely suffering. The scripture is very clear about this as we see in verse 17. We suffer with him. Becoming a child of God doesn't give you an instant promotion at a job or give you the best, par- best parking spot. Rather, we face seismic difficulties, and just as the present tense of the verb tells us, we suffer daily. However, we won't be crumbled, for there is eternal hope of glory in view for us. And it's it's not just the future hope that we are eagerly anticipating, but in our present reality, Paul says that we suffer with Christ. We share in Christ's suffering, which means Christ who suffered for us understands our pain and our sorrow, and he's with us in the very moment of our suffering. If you look at Acts 9, we see how the resurrected Christ asks Paul, who has been persecuting the church, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Christ identifies himself with his suffering children. So when no one seems to understand your pain and you feel like you're all alone in your suffering, Christ is with you. And he always has been. I'd like to show you a picture of a uh, famous running duo. Uh, do you guys see it? All right. So if you guys know these uh, gentlemen, so the older gentleman who is pushing the wheelchair is Dick Hoyt, and who is the father of the son, Rick Hoyt, uh, who, is, who uh, is sitting in the uh, wheelchair. Uh, and he has cerebral palsy. So after they participate in a five-mile benefit run with Rick in the wheelchair, Rick told his dad that when I'm running, it feels like I'm not, I'm not handicapped. Then his son's joy became his father's joy, motivating him to run more for Rick. And then as a team, they uh, completed various endurance races. I mean, his achievement is quite remarkable. For example, like they, they finished 72 marathons, 22 duathlons, running and cycling, 257 triathlons, and six Ironman competitions. That's 2.4 mile swim and 112 mile by, uh, cycling and a full marathon. So in total, they completed in 1,130 races. His father pulled Rick in a special boat as they, as they would swim and carried him in a special seat in front of his bike and pushed him in a wheelchair as they would run. And I think this dad's love can, captures, uh, can capture our father's, father God's great love towards us. In our suffering, we might be feeling like we are all alone and it seems like nothing is working out. But our God has been pushing and leading us every single moment. And it is a joy to him. 
And he continued to do so until the end. And when we finish our race, he will share his glory with us. Even though we didn't do anything, he'll say, good job. Good job, Chris. Good job, Gina. Good job, Stella. You did it. I'm so proud of you. That's what it means that we are adopted through Christ. This is who we are. And what a glorious hope we have, friends. What a glorious hope. The hope that we don't deserve, but hope that we truly receive. Now, before this hopeful and sobering truth, through the power of the Holy Spirit, who continues to lead us to the path of holiness, now we can boldly walk in obedience. We can walk away from sin because we want to walk towards holiness with Christ, not out of fear, but out of gratitude and thanksgiving for the amazing love and hope in our Savior, Jesus Christ, until we share in God's glory. So many experts say that the last earthquake in Turkey was violent, was not, but was not necessarily enough to bring down well-constructed buildings. If the owners and builders suit up to the expected earthquake uh, construction code, many would have survived. So on which ground are you building your, uh, your foundation of your faith? Is it your own effort or morality to save yourself that guarantees no hope? Or is it on Christ who adopts us, attests, and awards us through his spirit? And Romans 8, 14 to 17 tell us that you are a child of God because you receive the spirit adoption through the redeeming work of Christ. Thus, if you have chosen the former so far, stop trying to save yourself, but trust and find confidence in Christ. Yes, suffering comes. Yes, uh, fear comes in our way. But don't fall back to fear when suffering stands in our way. But remember your identity as a child and heir who will be glorified with Christ. This is who I am, and this is who you are. What a glorious hope, friends. Let us pray.